hello to everybody and welcome to our very first All Access Pass. You are a feisty crowd and I love it. Welcome here to the Queen's Lounge. Today is All Access, but well, first of all, I should say all of our All Access passes all week long, we're gonna be featuring a TV show called All Access Pass. This is your chance to have all access to some of your very, very favorite stars. Some of the people that you grew up with, some of the people that you followed for all of your young lives, and some of the people that you still follow today. We are blessed to have with us an amazing group, uh, a slate of entertainers, this cruise. I don't know that it's ever been stronger. We are very, very, very excited. And there's only one way to, yes, we're excited, right? And there's only one way to start a cruise like this with, uh, I mean, let's be honest, how much can we say about this man that has not already been said? We're gonna get him out here on stage, we're gonna have some fun, ask some questions, and uh, see if we can't learn a little bit more about the one, the only, the inimitable, Mr. Neil Sadaka. <laughs> What a crowd, what a crowd. They're excited to have you here, sir. They're very excited. Well, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for coming. How many of you, when you saw the 2015 lineup release on Neil's name and went and booked your tickets right there? How was the journey? How, how was getting to the ship? Everything go okay today? Very smooth. <laughs> we, stepped, we stopped in Fort Lauderdale and we got on the ship very smoothly and uh, no problem. All right. Well, you're here and you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Are you looking forward to this cruise? Oh, yes, I was here. Was it two years ago? Yeah. The audience is very, very responsive. They remember the oldies. Oh, yeah. And where they were, what they were doing, and music has that ability to bring it all back. That's gorgeous, that's gorgeous. And that's the whole idea behind, I mean, is that, is that why you make the music to a certain extent? Could you say that? Well, I was born to be a musician. I started writing at 13 years old, and I love to give pleasure to people. It's a God-given gift, and I love to share it with people. I happen to know that you are also a prodigy, not just as a writer, but if I'm not mistaken, you were in Juilliard at the age of nine years old. Is that truth or is that just you patting the bio? That is true, Jason. Um, I was nine years old and a teacher in public school in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Sent a note back home to my parents and asked them to buy a piano. And uh, I started with a private teacher at eight years old, and then nine, I got a scholarship to the prep school of the Juilliard in New York City, studying to be a concert pianist. What the hell happened? <laughs> that is a valid question. So you go from concert pianist to being rock and roll god. How, how does one make that transition? Well, classical music is wonderful for the soul, but not for the pocketbook. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Unless you're Evgeny Kissin and you play that way. But uh, I, I have no regrets. I've been around the world uh, as an American ambassador, music ambassador of goodwill. and that lady's hoping for your picture. We'll get you in a second, madam. Don't worry, we'll, we'll get him in there. This is not my good side. <laughs> <laughs> so you are, you are playing classical piano, and yes, it may not be the, uh, the most profitable uh, route in the world, but when you're, when you're young like that, when you're 12, 13 years old, how do you decide to make that transition? I mean, before you know it's about you know, making hit records and you know, yeah, maybe lying in your pocket a little bit, what's the, what's the inspiration to move to a new style of music? Well, a neighbor of mine was a 16-year-old poet, and his mother heard me playing Chopin and Bach. He, they lived in the same building in Brooklyn, New York, and he said, do you want to write songs? I said, I don't have the foggiest idea how to write songs, but I'm so happy he convinced me because we wrote 
500 songs together. His name, his name was Howard Greenfield. And I started writing for Atlantic Records, Laverne Baker, Clyde McFadder, the Cardinals, the Clovers, the Cookies. And then RCA Victor signed me as a singer songwriter in 1950. None of these kids remember that, don't worry about it. 58, 58 was the diary, the first one. Oh, diary. You remember? Who remembers the diary? I'll sing it, I'll sing it tomorrow. You said I'll sing it and everyone would, and you said tomorrow and they went, oh, okay, yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow. And it was inspired by Connie Francis, who was a dear friend of mine. I wrote several songs for her. I wrote Stupid Cupid mm -hmm. and Where the Boys Are. And she used to write in a diary. And that's what inspired Howie and I to write How I'd Like to Look into that little book, the one that has the lock and key. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's cool. What a great story. It's not every day a story connects back to someone like Connie Francis being the inspiration for these types of stories. Uh, the, the Brill Building. Wonderful time, 1958 to 63. It was a small office in New York City, and I brought Carol King up, who, who I dated in high school, believe it or not. You told Cat you. Her name, her name was Carol Klein, and I wrote a song called Oh Carol for her. And the Brill Building was a little office with a piano and a desk, and you wrote from 10 in the morning till five in the afternoon, five days a week. It was a great training ground. And you wrote for some of the all-time greatest performers that the world has ever known. Give us a little flavor of what you've written, who you've written for. What are your proud moments there? Oh, I think- You're proud of them all. But I think it. Love Will Keep Us Together. I got a Grammy for that. Oh. Um, uh, I wrote, uh, Elvis Presley did Solitaire. Uh, Frank Sinatra did The Hungry Years. Uh, Jimmy Clanton did Another Sleepless Night. Um, Fifth Dimension did Working on a Groovy Thing. Uh, many, many great artists. I'm very, very proud of that. That's a, that's a career, yeah, I mean, that's... How often do you write today? Every year I write a new collection. As a matter of fact, I'm going to debut two new songs as a first, never been heard, I just finished them, and I'll have the lyrics in front of me, but I wanted the Mold Shop Crews to hear it first. And I, I would love to see the reaction. I want to see the reaction. I think you just saw some of it. You haven't even done it. I think one of the reasons I've been around so long is I write a new collection every year for the last 63 years. That's an amazing arc. I, I did Juilliard at nine to then deciding that you needed to, to get into something a little cooler and finding someone who lives a couple doors away who wants to be in it with you, writing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of songs for the biggest artists in the world and still maintaining your own career at the same time. I know a lot of writers, whether it's uh, musical writers or comedy writers, they tend to focus just on writing, not a lot, still perform. How'd you find the balance to, to still do what you do? Well, I wrote mostly, practically all of the songs from my own records, my own voice, and I was lucky that uh, other great singers covered the songs, Andy Williams, Johnny Mathis, uh, Engelbert Humperdinck, ABBA, uh, because I write in a very small range, uh, so it's easy for vocalists to sing my songs. Smart, you make it open to everybody, that way you can sell them all. That's good, I like that, I like your thinking there. This is All Access Pass. We'll be back in just a few minutes time with more from the fabulous Neil Sadaka. Thank you so much. Here we are once again with the one and only Mr. Neil Sadaka. And it is, it is Sadaka. Sadaka. Rhymes with cracker. Oh, you want, oh, forgive me. Because uh, Frank Sinatra, they thought yeah. it was Neil Sadaka, but that's in Europe, they call me that. I've been educated, I know it will never happen again. Yeah.
So we've talked a little bit about your beginnings and your early career. Let's talk a little bit more, if you don't mind, about what's going on today. I know that you've, uh, you've transitioned into something that's kind of fun with your son. You've started uh, to dabble in the kids' world, if you will. Yes, I have three delicious grandchildren. <laughs> I have twin girls, 13, and a boy, nine. And they said, Papa, I'm Papa Neil. Papa, we love your old rock and roll songs, but could you change the words to make them child friendly? So we did a CD called Waking Up Is Hard To Do. And the kids were six or seven years old. They sang the doo-wop backgrounds. And on your grandkids? My grandkids. And on the record, we did, where the toys are. <laughs> da, 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 da. And we did, lunch, lunch will keep us together. <laughs> and it, it developed into a book. Yes, that's where I was going next. It developed into a book. A New York Times best-selling book. Number three Thank on the best-selling New York Times. <laughs> Number one and two were Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> Yeah, timing, exactly. Fifty Shades of Grey and then a kid's book. Perfect. But it, it's marvelous because they had illustrations in the book and I had a CD at the end of the book. So these two, three, four, five-year-olds learn how to read by looking at the words, illustrations, and the listening to the record. That's fantastic. Oh, that's fantastic. So there's, there's one book at the moment? Or? There was one book, one book. And, and one CD. And are there more in the works? Well, I am going on, I'm going back to my roots. Jason, right, Jason? Yes, sir. Um, I am starting to write. I just wrote a, a piano concerto called Manhattan Intermezzo that I recorded with the London Philharmonic on the last CD. Oh, yeah. So I'm going on the real Neil, this is the man who bought it. I always wonder who it was. There you are. Only the one. And I'm very proud. I wrote a symphony called Joie de Vivre, Joy of Life. So I'm going back to my roots as a classical musician. Oh, full circle. Full circle. Full circle. What's inspired that? What's inspired to take you back? Well, I think playing Debussy and Chopin and Bach and Mozart and all of them, you know, it, that's, that's what makes it special. You have to have that background in music. And you have to have that creative drive to top yourself. You have to reinvent Neil Sedaka. That's why I think the creative drive is, is there. That's fascinating. So clearly you never stopped playing. Your classical chops, you, you've been playing since nine. You've continued. Even as you forayed into the rock and roll world, you continued. I love to play, yes. How often do you play the piano? Well, I have a piano in every one of the places I live. So um, I play a couple of hours a day. Every day? Sure. Wow. Uh, WC, the Children's Corner, uh, the Black E Etude of Chopin. I play uh, the Walstein uh, Beethoven Sonata. So just the easy stuff. You just keep it to the simple stuff. How did I get into rock and roll? <laughs> Never know. Beethoven, he's an easy transition. Yeah, thank goodness, right? Let's be grateful that he did get into rock and roll. Uh, I, am, I have no regrets. I love every minute of it. I've been to every country in the world, recorded in six languages. Japanese was the easiest one. I mean, obviously. German was very hard. But uh, I wanted to be like Bobby Darin and Connie Francis, because they played the Copacabana in New York and all the adult uh, places. So I wanted to follow that. And as a result, I went to all of these countries. I was the first American rock and roller in South America, in Japan, in Australia. So it has been a marvelous journey. How often do you tour now? I do about 25, 30 concerts a year. Wow. Internationally, or do you stay no, in New York, no. LA? Uh, I stay in the United States now. Where do you love to play? Where are your, where are your favorite places to play? Well, I do mostly symphony dates. I do con uh, casinos and theaters. 
Yeah, but I had the great thrill of Carnegie Hall, of Lincoln Center, uh, the Albert Hall in London. So it, it's been um, an impossible, crazy journey. I can imagine, I can imagine. And what's coming up? What kind of dates do you have coming up after the cruise, after you perform for us? Well, I'll be uh, at the Kentucky uh, Symphony. I just wrote a new piece for, for the symphony called uh, uh, Russian Rhapsody. And um, I love doing the casinos. I do a little poker machine, that's about it for me. <laughs> the one-armed bandit, I can see it. The poker machine. Uh, but I loved what I do. I love what I do, and I, I really, I think that's the thing. People look at me and they say, this is, whatever you see is what you get. And this is, they could tell I'm having a great time. I can tell you're having a great time, I tell you. So I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit here. Let's just say that we can no longer write music and we can no longer play music. Not for any bad reason. Just, just, let's just say, what would Mr. Sadaka be doing if it wasn't music? Papa Neil. Papa Neil. Just, just going Papa with Neil. The, going with the grandchildren, going to the movies, going to the uh, amusement parks. I'm a roller coaster freak. Are you? You're I, a speed demon. I love that. <laughs> I live on the edge. <laughs> apparently, apparently. Uh, and, and what do you think career-wise? What would it have been if you don't think you, what, would you have any aspirations other than music, even as a little kid, you know, you wanted to be a firefighter Never. or a transformer, G.I. Joe? Never, my, my parents said that when I was an infant, I wouldn't eat unless the radio was playing music. I, I was born for this. Clearly. Yes. You weren't given a choice. I was born for this. And it's marvelous to bring back the, the memories. It, it's, a, it's such a wonderful thing because uh, I get emails from all over the world, people who are ailing uh, physically, emotionally, and music is very, very therapeutic. People don't realize that. I mean, even infants, to play music to the infants, you can see a, a reaction. Did you play for your grandchildren even when they were just, I'm sh I can only imagine that the grandkids have had the best concerts of your life and their lives. They get front row seats to oh, yes. the Papa Neil. And uh, my grandson uh, loves all the Elton John and Billy Joel and the Beatles. So at seven years old, Paul McCartney invited me to take my grandson to the MGM in Las Vegas. <laughs> And he said, Papa, my heart is beating. I'm so nervous. We went backstage and I said, now he doesn't look like the pictures on your wall. He's a little, <laughs> a little bit older, so don't say anything. But to see Paul McCartney and my grandson brought all of his records and t-shirts and Thank Paul you. is the greatest. He signed everything. Sign everything. On that absolutely perfect note, thanks for tuning in. Sit tight. More with Neil Sadaka in just a moment. All right, welcome back. We're back once again with the fabulous Neil Sadaka. Now, Mr. Sadaka, as a as a performer of your caliber, will understand, of course. There's nothing like breaking down the fourth wall. There's nothing like creating a connection with your crowd. So in an attempt to let the audience participate in today's Q&A, we submitted, or uh, circulated, I should say, some questions from the audience cards. I have a handful of questions, and uh, we're just gonna put you on the spot and see where you go. Right, right off the bat, this question is uh, from Norman, who is otherwise known as Santa, who's a... Uh... Norman, ooh, I didn't write that. <laughs> His question is, Mr. Sadaka, what is your favorite Christmas song? Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Mel Torme wrote the greatest one. Mel Torme. All right. Ooh. This question is from Nancy, and Nancy says, Neil, how is your daughter? Question mark. Are you related to Edie Gourmet? Third question, is your name from the, from the word Sadaka? My, my dear cousin, who passed away recently, is Edie Gourmet. Oh. She was a marvelous, marvelous singer. 
uh, my daughter Dara uh, had a hit with me. We had one of the few father and daughter hits in 1980, a song called Should Have Never Let You Go. <laughs> Very few. Only the Sinatras and the Coles did father and daughter duets. And with your son, he's involved with the new project with the book and the series. Yes, the absolutely. Stuff, right? so you performed with both of your children. Yes, uh, there was another question. Yes, is your name come from the word tzedakah? It means charity in Hebrew. Oh. Yes, my grandparents came to New York City in 1904 from Istanbul, Turkey. And they uh, moved to the Lower East Side of New York and that's where my father was born. Okay. Janice from Maryland would like to know, what was the inspiration for the song, You? Mm. Well, you know, it's a, it's a very touching song. It's for all the people that I love. I write with my heart and soul, and I like a good cry. I feel if I can cry and, and transfer that to the audience, that is an accomplishment, because I think that that's what music is about, that emotion. So there we are. They say the audience feels twice what you do on stage, uh, you know, the showbiz adage, and I think that you're been testifying to that, basically. And Sammy Davis, rest his soul, said, never sweat, Neil. You know, let the audience come to you. Don't push. And it was very wise, very, very wise. And then it's, it's kind of a chemistry between the audience and the performer. And if you get on the same wavelength, you got it. Mrs. Glenn Fisher from Sydney, Australia says, in the book Rock and Roll Survival, Neil Sedaka, written by Rich Podolsky. Ha, ha, written by that Rich Podolsky over there, apparently. He has the book. You're the one who bought it. Yeah, <laughs> that is the book. How did you feel about telling the world about such personal information about your life? Well, nothing is all uh, rosy. Uh, every artist goes through difficult times with management and uh, struggle. I was a survivor. I did not have a hit for almost 14 years, and I, I wanted it desperately. So I uh, stayed at the piano, uh, the Beatles came in, I figured if the Beatles came to New York, I would go to London. <laughs> <laughs> and the English people were very faithful to the American rock and rollers. And I met Elton John, who was starting a record company called Rocket Records. And I wrote a song called Laughter in the Rain, and he promoted it and made it number one after 14 years of off the chart. Ooh, here's a good one. Linda says, what's your favorite song that you've ever recorded? Yeah. There's over 700 songs. So it should be easy. <laughs> you know, it's like- Talk a couple then. You know, Writers always say, these are my children. How can you uh, pick one? But I would say the magic song was Laughter in the Rain, because it brought me back. It was me and Tina Turner had the biggest comebacks of, of the, all the, of history. So that was the one that brought me back. All right, Laughter in the Rain. Arlene, originally from Brooklyn, says, have you been back to Brighton Beach and Lincoln High School since? Every year I go back to visit the old high school, to see the beach to see, I was very uh, honored. They have a street named Neil Sedaka. And uh, I, I like going back. I, most of my songs are very reflective. They, they talk about going back. And uh, I had a very happy childhood. I'm, I'm fortunate. That is very fortunate. Mm -hmm. Bill from Indiana asks, what is on your musical bucket list? Well, I thought of a Broadway show, but it took Carol King eight years, <laughs> and Jersey Boys are almost eight years until it went to Broadway. So they're talking about doing a uh, documentary, a movie, about the life of Neil Sedaka. <laughs> so you're not, you're not subjected to a New York Times reviewer. <laughs> Yeah, at least we go to Netflix if it doesn't yeah. go very well and you go, you go you got all the world. Now. Yeah. Videos and Netflix. Uh, I heard Brad Pitt is going to play you in your younger years. Is that true? Absolutely, absolutely. Could it be any other way? 
What is on your bucket list non-musically? I think just to fulfill myself as a human being, to uh, bring uh, joy as a friend, as a husband, as a uh, grandfather, as a father, uh, keep the family together because the family, I think, is the, the most important thing. That's a wonderful sentiment. What are you looking forward to this cruise outside of your productions, outside of your big shows? The food. The food, yeah, why not? The food. I'm fat but happy. <laughs> they often go hand in hand, I find. That's good. Uh, how many cruises have you done? Not, not just malt shop, in general. Have you cruised a lot? My wife and I were on many, many cruises over the years. QE1, QE2. Uh, Queen Mary, uh, crossing from New York, all the, liners, yeah. all the liners from New York to England, to south of France. Uh, I've sung on many, many a ship and took a lot of uh, pills for sea <laughs> <laughs> The motion of the ocean gets to you. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, ginger ale, they say. Or they say drink as much wine as you can. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, because then you won't know the boat's rocking. You're just right down the... You're actually the only one walking straight at that point, so it's perfect. If there was a place in the world you have not performed, it's the last question on here, where would it be? Where would you want to go? Eastern Europe. I, I've never performed in Russia, uh, Czechoslovakia, <laughs> Hungary, Poland. Uh, otherwise, I've been to every other country in the world. I'd like to see Eastern Europe. Uh, maybe uh, where Mozart wrote all of his beautiful things in uh, Vienna. Beautiful. I know you have a busy, busy day, and I appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. It's, uh, I think we all learned a lot. I think we had some great moments, and that's what this show is all about. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks, and our live studio audience. Do me a favor, one more time, let's hear from the fabulous Neil Sadaka. Thanks for tuning in to All Access. More for you coming up soon.